Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Amitabha Chattopadhyay. I'm uh, a professor of marketing and the GlaxoSmithKline Chair Professor of Corporate Innovation at INSEAD. And today we uh, have a webinar uh, on Xiaomi, where to do next with uh, myself and uh, two great uh, uh, expert panelists whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Why Xiaomi? Uh, I got interested in Xiaomi because it's a in, very intriguing company. Think about it. It started in 2010. It was founded by Lei Jun, the serial entrepreneur, and it started by offering a, a operating system called MUI uh, for free. Uh, by the end of the decade, uh, Xiaomi had uh, revenues of 35 billion US dollars, and it was the world's largest IoT player with over 320 million uh, connected devices. That, you know, if you look at its revenue growth, that's faster than Amazon, faster than Google, faster than Facebook. So uh, it's a pretty in incredible achievement. And um, notwithstanding all the, um, shall we say, uh, turbulence that, that the world is experiencing. Uh, you know, it, the, the half yearly results published in June 30 suggest that the company is growing at a healthy clip. It now has a uh, annualized revenue of 40 billion uh, US dollars uh, for the 22 calendar year. And uh, it had, 527 million connected devices as of June 30th this year. So quite incredible. So how the, 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 what really intrigued me was how did Xiaomi pull this off, okay? And it pulled it off in a super competitive environment. Not only are, you know, in China are the global majors like uh, Apple and Samsung present, but there's a whole host of homegrown um, competitors, including giants like Huawei, okay? And so um, it, it really was something special. And uh, what the way I'd like to structure today's session is to uh, spend maybe the next 10, 15 minutes uh, on the first two questions, a brief overview of Xiaomi's journey uh, from zero to 35 billion, uh, what can we learn from the case that uh, I wrote, which came out last year with my former student and uh, now uh, colleague at Johns Hopkins University, Haiyang Yang. Um, and then um, we'll open it up uh, to our expert panelists uh, to find out about the main question here, which is where to next. Uh, and Xiaomi last year, for example, announced that it was getting into the electric car space. Um, you know, what do our panelists think about that? What are the lessons that can be learned from Xiaomi's international expansion, particularly in India, where it is the number one uh, player in the uh, in its space? Um, beyond Xiaomi, what what can we find out about the giants in the tech space? And you know, with the geopolitical headwinds that China is facing, what does that mean for uh, Chinese business at large? Uh, the two panelists that we have are uh, Kathy Ningchen, who's an associate professor uh, at the College of Business and Economics at UAE University. Uh, Kathy has a PhD uh, from uh, the City University of Hong Kong and then has a master's and undergraduate degree from Peking University, which is one of China's top uh, universities in information systems. Um, Kathy's research, uh, she's published over 80 papers in various top-notch journals around the world. And uh, she has 15 years of consulting experience. So she straddles both, uh, uh, if you will, the ivory tower of academia and the real world. Uh, my colleague, Guo Li Chen, uh, is a professor of strategy. He's, um, his, real, his main research interest is in understanding 
sort of the interactions between the CEO, the board and top executives and, and how uh, those interactions and the choices uh, affect the choices that firms make and ultimately their performance. He's extensively published in top academic journals. He's uh, on the editorial board of the Academy of Management Journal, one of the top journals in his field. And most recently, he's written a book on Chinese companies called Seeing the Unseen Behind Chinese Tech Giants Global Venturing. So we have uh, uh, two really solid experts that we are going to turn to uh, in a short while. So the rise of Xiaomi. So Xiaomi started, as I said, by launching a free uh, operating system, which could sit on any Android phone uh, in 2010. And a year later, in August 2011, uh, it launched its first smartphone. Okay, And it targeted the tech-savvy, value-conscious consumers uh, with a value proposition, which was quality smartphone, smartphones at an affordable price. So good match between uh, the um, brand positioning and the target audience. Uh, and it made a public statement that it was not going to charge more than 5% margin on its uh, uh, mobile phones. Uh, it launched a series of hero products. These products, um, you know, would be, uh, they, they were, you know, there was a shortage of available handsets. The handsets would be launched on Xiaomi's uh, portal and they would sell out within 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and so there was the scarcity which created a cachet uh, for the brand because it was selling out, uh, selling out so fast. And within uh, the short space of uh, a couple of years, Xiaomi was the number one selling uh, smartphone in China. A very, very impressive um, outcome given, as you can see, the competitive landscape that it was, it was operating in. But, you know, the other companies are no laggards and um, very quickly, um, the uh, big giants like Huawei, uh, Oppo, Vivo, but which, which are both owned brands owned by Bobogao in, in China, uh, you know, got onto this value proposition that, uh, that um, Xiaomi was offering. And indeed, <clears throat> uh, Huawei launched a sub-brand called Honor, which targeted exactly the space, offering the kinds of uh, features that Xiaomi was offering at the price point that, that Xiaomi was operating at. And so the net result was that you know, by 2016, Xiaomi has, had fallen from the number one spot to uh, the number five spot, uh, just behind Apple, with the lead being taken by Huawei and Oppo, who were neck and neck at that point. So the question that faced uh, uh, Lei Jun and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the company at large was, what do we do to regain our, our position and how do we have something that is sustainable? So what were the challenges? So first of all, the tech savvy customer segment was pretty much saturated. Secondly, the broader target segment who might be value conscious and would like to get a hold of a uh, Xiaomi product would require uh, Xiaomi to move from a purely online uh, sales to bricks and mortar because they needed handholding to be able to understand what the, how the phone worked, what its features were and feel comfortable about buying it. And then, the, but that was a problem because if you have a bunch of hero, a few hero products, like every few, uh, you know, months or a year, you launch a new new phone that supersedes your existing phone. In, in that world, uh, it's very hard to have a physical retail presence because a retail presence is expensive. B, you know, imagine going into a store which just has, you know, one or maybe the previous generation and the current generation of a handphone. Uh, it's just, this is not a workable proposition. So, so what could 
you know, what could or should uh, Xiaomi do? This was a question that was on, weighing on their minds in 2016. The insight that uh, they had was that, you know, they were known for their smartphones. So whatever they did had to somehow build uh, on the smartphone. And the key insight that they had was the smartphone could act as a control center or a, um, uh, for all the handheld, for, sorry, for, for uh, in-home IoT devices. So uh, this, this insight then meant that they would have to move into a whole range of new, uh, new products, which could be uh, interconnected by their, by, uh, through their own, um, how shall I put it, their own uh, IoT operating system uh, uh, to control all these different devices. But Xiaomi had no expertise or experience in making all these de devices, so what should they do? They decided to go with a partnership model and um, they, 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 they followed a pretty unique path in terms of choosing their, um, their partners. They handpicked that the co-founders or senior executive would handpick the, the, the partners that they would have uh, from the social networks of these individuals. Uh, secondly, they focused exclusively on small or startup firms that focused on a single category. And the third thing is that um, with each partner, Xiaomi bought a small stake, not a controlling stake, but a small stake. And the logic was the following, that if Xiaomi had a uh, stake in the company, then Xiaomi's winning meant the company that they were buying into winning. Right, so it created a win-win solution. Secondly, Xiaomi had visibility on their capability, their costs, and so on, and were able to bring their greater skill set to support these partners. So, for example, they could um, uh, make consolidated purchases of uh, in, in inputs to the for these firms. They could provide technical and design. Uh, the support, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, greatly benefited uh, greatly benefited the partners. The, so, so, so now I've figured out how to get this portfolio of products. Now the question is, how do I deal with my uh, bricks and mortar distribution? And uh, traditionally in the Chinese marketplace, there was a telecom street in every city. So all the telecom players, you know, Huawei, Oppo, uh, uh, Lenovo, et cetera, et cetera, would all have retail outlets that sold on the telecom street. And the question that Xiaomi pondered was, was, was it the right thing for them to do to uh, put their shops in the, um, on the telecom street next to their competitors, uh, as was tradition, or should they chart a different path? And if so, what? Uh, and Xiaomi decided that they would chart a different path because in their view, as they moved from being a pure handset player to being an integrated IoT player, they were moving from offering a bundle of features to actually delivering a lifestyle. And so they felt that they needed to be where people went shopping for lifestyle products. And in particular, lifestyle products that had the value proposition of quality at a good price. And so they decided that they would use as a rule of thumb, where is Uniqlo um, located and put their shops in the shopping centers or malls where Uniqlo had its outlets. And so uh, they decided to open up uh, retail outlets. You can see this is from uh, the retail outlet in Shanghai, I believe. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's in a mall where one of the anchor stores is, is Uniqlo uh, because people, will people who want to buy quality lifestyle products that are not terribly expensive uh, were 
shared customer segment between Uniqlo and, and our friends at, uh, at Xiaomi. Now, from a product point of view, uh, I need a big portfolio and I showed you a big, you know, potentially what could be a portfolio, but where do you start? And Xiaomi started by looking at the closest products that would go with phones. So for example, a smartwatch uh, is an obvious uh, product that was already there for Apple, for Samsung, for a lot of the other players. Uh, and then adding to that, the feature of being able to pay by using your smartphone uh, made it uh, cutting edge back in the day. And so they started with products that were very close to the smartphone. And then they slowly expanded outwards, um, selling you know, television sets, refrigerators, home security systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, till today, they even sell uh, backpacks, okay? So you go to a Xiaomi store, you'll not only find consumer you know, phones, then consumer electronics, but then everything else. Um, so it's quite fascinating how they've expanded into the product space and uh, very, very successfully uh, created uh, a broader Xiaomi uh, brand. So what, what do we learn from this? I mean, uh, this uh, incredible story. Uh, first of all, I think, I think it's important to understand that they stuck to their original brand positioning with minor nuances. So they didn't change the point of differentiation, which was quality at an afford affordable price. What they changed was they broadened this definition of customer from tech savvy consumers to broadly consumers uh, and uh, from smartphones to products, electronic products in the beginning, and then products at large as they expanded. So uh, the, the, and, and then they deepened the uh, positioning by shifting to lifestyle, which has a more emotional spin, uh, which, uh, which they did through uh, the imagery. So for example, if you look at the smartphone imagery, it's clearly uh, not, not focusing on functional benefits, but really how cool it would be to, to have this uh, feature of paying through your watch. So, uh, uh, so that, that, that's sort of lesson number one. Secondly, they moved into adjacent categories, okay? And the choice of these adjacent categories was driven by what the target customer wanted, okay? Uh, they moved, you know, in a world where people are trying to go from bricks and mortar distribution to online, they moved in the opposite direction. But that move was number one, driven by the needs of customers. And number two, the online distribution data helped them optimize um, the uh, location and uh, assortment that each store sold because you know from the zip codes, what's selling where, which are the areas which are hot pockets for your products uh, and which products, and you can move those in there. Plus of course, products where uh, demonstration is super useful. Uh, the partnership model was super important because it meant that they had companies that were experts because they were focused on a category. Uh, these were small companies, so they could be supported by Xiaomi, but at the same time, uh, uh, they, were, they became loyal to Xiaomi because Xiaomi helped them to get the distribution to be able to grow way faster than they could have done on their own. And by having this partnership model, they moved from an easily copyable competitive advantage, which in the past was simply making, producing more, uh, producing a, a more feature-laden product at, the, at a lower price, to a capability of selecting and managing partners, uh, which is an internal skill 
uh, which is hard for the external world to copy. And then, of course, as you move into the IoT world, you have a, a, a network uh, of products and that are based on a particular operating system, IoT operating system. Uh, it has a particular design aesthetic. And so once you've gone down that rabbit hole, you're unlikely to switch, switch away. So uh, when, when it comes to replacing your existing phone or buying another IoT product, you will remain loyal to Xiaomi. So uh, a, a great move overall. So we, we kind of tried to summarize uh, the, these and some other points uh, uh, in a HBR article. And, the, and, 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 and a key part of the takeaway that we had there was that uh, Xiaomi is playing an interesting game. It's playing both a game of low cost and differentiation. And if you go back to classic strategy, we can have differentiation or we can have low cost. The two cannot coexist. But by uh, sort of creating this model, which we call strategic coalescence, Xiaomi has been able to bring, create a platform that brings its consumers and partners together in an ecosystem, which allows them simultaneously to have um, a low cost and differentiation. So, so much for that. Let me uh, stop sharing and then open up the, um, To the Q and A, and maybe uh, let me uh, kick off. Uh, uh, Kathy, you have your uh, video turned off. Maybe I can thank you. Uh, so maybe Kathy, I will ask you the first question. Um, so, as I mentioned right at the outset, Xiaomi has announced, I think last year, uh, in around this time last year, that it was getting into um, the electric vehicle space, and uh, in some sense, it was even positioned as a Jun's last Torah. Uh, so what do you think of uh, this idea and uh, where do you think it's going? Uh, I think electric vehicle has a huge demand and, and this is where many um, you know, countries are heading to. And also China also put a lot of support for uh, electric vehicle development uh, uh, and provide a lot of subsidies. And I, at this point, I think Xiaomi is entering the third phase if we say the first phase, they experienced very fast growth, and the second phase, they were facing a lot of uh, you know competition and slowing down in the domestic market. They forced to go abroad for internationalization. Now, I think after the pandemic, they're facing the they're, they're entering the third phase, so they need to expand so-called internet platform. Uh, so, electric vehicle for Xiaomi is similar as their smartphone, serving as a platform. So it's a kind of ambition uh, for Xiaomi. It's also kind of a necessity for them to stay in the game. But I think there are a lot of challenges uh, when Xiaomi move into this uh, new game. I think the first uh, challenge comes from the R&D um, because the Xiaomi recently, they um, have pretty much spent money on uh, acquiring uh, the relative uh, related platforms to strengthen their R&D. Uh, in this new uh, area, uh, they invested in smart drive, smart electric, and smart uh, cockpit. So the question is, you know, how to put this together uh, to forge a strong R&D team uh, and the strength for Xiaomi product? Uh, that's question mark. Uh, and also, I think the uh, competition is definitely something that Xiaomi needs to handle uh, because nowadays uh, this uh, market is a uh, you know, full of uh, very powerful competitors, uh, BYD together with Huawei is really uh, take the lead in this area. So uh, what would be the advantage for Xiaomi to play in this game? And also uh, we have to understand that uh, down the road, the subsidy from the government may reduce because at the beginning, this kind of product has uh, heavily subsidized by the government. Uh, but down the road, uh, according to the number I found today, you know, by, two, by 2025, the estimated demand is about 5.3 million, but the supply capacity will reach 36.6 million. So what does that mean? That means it doesn't require a lot of subsidy for, you know, government to support this, uh, you know, industry. Now, that means, you know, they have to handle, 
you know, increasing operating costs, but with much less profit margin and, you know, how to make it work. And managing supply chain capacity is totally different from a, you know, supply chain for a smartphone. Uh, it actually has, uh, you know, uh, is more demanding. So Xiaomi managing the, you know, the IoT platform and all of these the home products by organizing this uh, ecosystem and working with the partners, uh, with that also work for, uh, you know, smart, uh, you know, electric vehicle, uh, this new product. And finally, I think, you know, this uh, consumer positioning also might be another concern. Uh, although Xiaomi uh, actually accumulated a huge uh, consumer base uh, with their existing smartphone and IoT products. However, um, the marketing survey actually shows for those consumers, uh, they're expecting the price, uh, expected price for uh, electric vehicle is about, you know, 100,000 RMB or below. So they're still want to have like a cost for, you know, uh, cost effective or budget product. While Xiaomi, according to their announcement, their target price is, uh, you know, above 100,000 to 300,000 RMB. So how to change that brand positioning uh, will be another challenge for Xiaomi to uh, enter this new field. So I will stop here. Yeah. So, so, so those, are, those are very interesting points, particularly, you know, when you consider that uh, what, what I heard you saying is that, um, you know, if you're going to have a car at around 300,000 uh, renminbi, then uh, probably you're targeting a very different consumer because the existing consumers of uh, Xiaomi want something that's sub $100,000. And those are those are very far apart. In addition, you have issues related to, uh, you know, the support. Uh, manufacturing, managing a completely different supply chain, getting into a space where you have uh, companies that are way, way ahead in the game. As you mentioned, Huawei uh, ha has, uh, you know, gotten uh, ahead, uh, is, has an agreement with BYD. I, I read somewhere that they've also tied up with uh, Audi and uh, a few other international automakers. So, so there's, this is, there are some real headwinds uh, uh, to think about. Uh, 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 I'm wondering, Goli, would you like to add uh, something uh, to what Kathy said? Yeah, hi, Amitava. Uh, and Casey, I, I, um, I think to a large extent, I agree with all your key points. I, I think it, it is very challenging. Um, but I think despite all the challenges behind it, there's a strong strategic reason why Xiaomi want to do this, right? If you think about first, like the smartphone industry, right? It's kind of getting saturated. And if you think about the Xiaomi's strategy in those earlier days, the profit margin actually is very low. And then the more recent uh, quarterly data shows that, I mean, partially because of these like, uh, you know, zero po uh, COVID policy in China and partially because of the, you know, the whole industry is getting become more and more saturated. And then the more recent quarters data shows that the smartphone sales actually is kind of declining, right? So as a public list company, and then the management team have to think like, where is the next growth engine, right? And uh, IoT devices, for sure, I think it's doing, doing very well and still keep on in growing. But actually autonomous vehicle, that is the place that I think it can create a big imagination for the capital market. Think about the total market size of the global car, it's about 3.7 trillion uh, in 2022. And versus the smartphone markets globally, it's only like about 500 billion, right? So which means like once it get into this industry, then it can create the you know, potential. Again, when I say it's the potential of the, the, the growth, right? Of course, like I, I fully agree with you that it can, could, could to be very competitive. So the issue is like all the question that we need to ask ourselves is like to what extent that we think that the Xiaomi have the core competence to get into this kind of a little bit unrelated industry, right? Think about the smartphone to the autonomous vehicle. This is a very different industry. But if we have more careful analysis, I think Xiaomi, at least I think they have some advantage, which is pretty unique, right? And, and 
one of course it's it has a group of like highly talented software engineer and hardware engineer in the last few years actually the xiaomi also built up their capability of the industrial design right um and also supply chain management. Of course, the supply chain management of the automobile industry could be different from the smartphone industry. But the more important things is about the company's learning capability, right? How fast that they can learn and adapt and see what's the challenge because the autonomous vehicle itself, actually, it's a relatively new. I mean, like a Tesla, it's again, it's a more, more, more recent player, right? In, in, the, in the last kind of decades and then, uh, so there's some traditional car player, there's some new uh, automobile players. So Xiaomi, I think it's true, it's a little bit late, but if if we can put our benefits to those to Xiaomi in terms of learning capability, then I think it still have chance because the autonomous vehicle, it's a kind of combination of the software and then the hardware, right? Software, it's about the software, uh, software engineering, the platform systems and then the hardware is about the design plus the supply chain management and then fundamentally it's the organization's learning capability so uh, if i want to paint a bit like more positive view and i would like to say we need to take a look of the what is the core competence of the xiaomi thanks Kuli. So, so one of the things that neither of you brought up and i'm wondering if it's relevant here is regulation because um in the sense that you know uh, smartphones aren't regulated, uh, but the auto industry is for a variety of reasons, uh, safety, et cetera. There is a lot of regulation around it. And so, uh, you know, to what extent would, a, would that pose a challenge for Xiaomi in, 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 this, in this new space? Uh, thank you for raising this uh, issue. Actually, I did check out the current market permit. Uh, or permit to go to market. And currently, you know, there were basically three ways for EV companies to go to market. Either they do OEM or they can purchase a company with a permit or, you know, they apply permit by themselves. So with the increasing demand and, uh, sorry, the supply, uh, at this point, uh, you know, the, the recent po policy seems like it's not issued, uh, the central government is stopped issuing the permit and then they delegate this, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, regulation to the, you know, provincial or regional, uh, you know, government. And the current st status for Xiaomi is they haven't got the, they haven't got this permit yet. And they want to be by themselves. So uh, that is actually adding a little bit uncertainty um, for, 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 for this form. And also I agree with uh, Guo Li. I think uh, you know, Xiaomi still have some advantage in that the entire supply chain capacity in China probably will add in you know, uh, some safe cushion for all EV companies in China. And also I did a little bit search uh, you know, regarding different technologies. Actually the pure EV, um, you know, uh, EV cars, uh, it's not as that demanding for you know, uh, manufacturing uh, engine cars. So that is, uh, you know, probably the good news for a company like Xiaomi, <laughs> you know, when they try to manage this uh, supply chain capabilities, yeah. Well, thank you, Kathy. So, you know, we've already touched upon this idea of international expansion, and uh, I can uh, see that, um, uh, you know, the second question uh, that, that I had for you regarding international expansion and lessons from India are actually questions that, that are also popping up in, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, chat. So uh, one of the questions that I, that's out there is, uh, and maybe we can begin with this and broaden it out from there, is uh, it says uh, uh, Rafael Alush uh, asks, uh, he's curious to get uh, your view on Xiaomi's strategy towards deeper penetration of their domestic market and product diversification versus deeper internationalization of their core products uh, beyond uh, beyond Asia. So, um, can you, you know, um, maybe uh, you know I can throw this question to Guoli uh, and then come back to you Kathy in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, Guoli, any thoughts on this? Sure. Um, maybe let me focus on 
the international expansion first. I mean, for sure, like the China is the you know big domestic markets, and then within this that domestic market have already uh, breathed a large number of like big companies, including Xiaomi. And I think the questions I think is very relevant, and and especially for today, it's about the globalization of the Chinese company, right? And you know what, like in our book, talking about this like Chinese tech giants, the global venture, we found that not many Chinese companies doing well in their globalizations. And Xiaomi, perhaps it's one of the very few exceptions, actually, if you think about the revenue uh, from outside China, international markets, it's about like 40% of the total sales. So to me, I think this is a big achievement compared to like Alibaba. We know Alibaba, we know Tencent, but actually the international sales from uh, for, for these two companies is much lower compared to Xiaomi, right? Um, so uh, how, how can you do this, right? Um, so in our book, actually, we we try to create a very simple and powerful of useful framework. We call this like pop leadership, right? So what does it mean, right? So the, the pop is P-O-P, P is like the product, O is organization, another P is people. And of course, very important about the leadership, right? So, so these are the four major parameters for, for any firm to consider like overseas journey. And then what are the factors that you should pay attention, right? Fundamentally, it's it looks like this is the what kind of products and offerings that you're going to offer, right? I'm going to localize your products, right? Uh, do you have the right people to execute the strategy and how to deliver, right? The whole management and um, customer interface. And do you have the right organizational structure to do the resource allocation, information sharing, incentivize people, and fundamentally, how is the leadership managerial attention and commitment? So, so if you if we use the Xiaomi as an example, right? Xiaomi's founder, Lei Jun, uh, I think he's the, the, the person who really drive the Xiaomi's like internationalization. So he pays special attention and efforts uh, and and for instance, specifically like the Indian market, right? So he, he visit Indian very often over the years. He has a very comprehensive understanding of the Indian's economy, the culture, uh, the software industry, and um, so understand the market, right? And what's more, I think is the well uh pays sufficient attention to the Indian market. Uh, he openly said, actually, he would put the priority of the Indian market even ahead of the Chinese market or domestic market. But he's very willing to give the Indian leadership a strong supporting hand. Instead of like making all the decisions by himself, Leiju empowered his local leadership team in India on a number of the critical steps, right? So one of the, the, the concrete example is like Xiaomi has built several factories in India, right? So considering the strong manufacturing capacity in China, and also in China, it's very easy to assess the full supply chain in China, right? To relocate part of the smartphone manufacturing to India, what it needs is not only about the courage or the commitment, actually also the empowerment of the local leadership team, right? So it's true. I think the question about that domestic penetrations or this like internationalization or internalization are going to face a lot of challenges. But if you do the more careful analysis, like I said, like pop leadership framework, right? And then using Xiaomi and then take a look what's the leadership of the Legion, the whole team, and then how they push this like internationalizations and, and focus on not only about the product, but also the people, organizational structure. So that that could be like one of the good lessons from, from Xiaomi's internationalization efforts. I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely spot on because as you were speaking, I was saying, you know, uh, maybe 15 years ago, I did uh, some work with LG Electronics and their entry into India. And what you said about uh, Mr. Lesion's uh, focus on India, his understanding of the market, his uh, you know, visiting locally, empowering the local local decision making, building manufacturing locally, and all that. I mean, th this this is so similar to the story uh, that LG had 15, 20 years ago, and uh, 
uh, you know, uh, they they were the last to enter India amongst the white good players, and uh, they became in a short span of three years the number one uh, white goods brand uh, in the in the Indian marketplace. So, uh, so you know, there seems to be clearly a lot of uh, not just sort of Xiaomi, but there seems to be a lot of weight behind uh, the analysis that you just offered us. Uh, so thank you. Kathy, did you want to uh, speak uh, additionally on, on the topic of the internationalization of Xiaomi? Sure. Uh, we actually conduct this um, you know, case study back in 2018. I think at that moment, Xiaomi had uh, quite several tries with the international market. Um, I think uh, Guoli actually talked about the push uh, factors that make it work. Um, but before we see the success in India, Xiaomi actually failed in Brazil market. And uh, the VP for international was also resigned later on. Um, and the, even with the Indian market, it's actually learned the result. The first phase um, back in 2014, they actually didn't have all-in strategy, but rather just testing, you know, whether their business models still work. Uh, you know, Xiaomi, actually, the reason they can save a lot in marketing simply because they use this fan-based uh, business model. They rely on online channels a lot for marketing, for advertising, and even for the sales channel. Um, now, in India, they use this to test the demand at the beginning, but once they realize that India market is quite different and also very lucrative, uh, because if you look at the largest uh, smartphone market, the first one is China, the second one is uh, India. So it deserves more resources and focus. So in 2015, they have this Indian first strategy. This is from the company's perspective. And I think another friendly, you know, uh, pool reason at the moment, we have to also look at, you know, when we choose the, you know, foreign market, uh, there were many, you know, Xiaomi could go to Europe, could go to Middle East, could go to uh, US. So which market is actually more challenging? That was our, you know, research question at the moment. Initially, we thought for a Chinese firm, simply because of the liability of foreigners, it might be more challenging for Chinese firms to penetrate, say, European market. But when we interviewed Xiaomi, uh, you know, uh, the leadership a team, they actually uh, told us uh, the opposite story. And they were also surprised. They said, we, uh, we didn't expect as much uh, you know, difficulty in European market, but rather they expect a lot of challenges uh, in Indian market. Uh, so that actually, you know, raised, uh, you know, uh, give us a little bit different perspective. It seems like for Xiaomi's product, value for money, uh, a mature market, a mature market when the consumers are more concerned about, you know, what they get, uh, attach less on branding. Uh, it seems like much easier and friendly for company like Xiaomi. So Xiaomi in those market uh, pretty much rely on the local agencies and have, uh, you know, a little bit easy operation uh, to you know, penetrate in the European market. But in India, it's a totally different story. And uh, you know, not only for the branding and uh, you know, customer per perception, uh, they're facing a lot of challenges. And also the local uh, regulatory environment is far more complicated. The reason Xiaomi has to invest in the Indian market is simply because uh, you know, the high import tax um, you know, apply to the, you know, the parts or the, you know, the products. So it's not possible for them to operate that way. Um, and also to get more, uh, you know, support from the local governments, they also need to have the full 100% localization. So in that sense, like internal versus and external reasons uh, make Xiaomi in India become like a 100% localized Indian form. So I think that is a, uh, uh, as Wally mentioned, represent probably the highest level of internationalization. So uh, besides the local uh, manufacturing, Xiaomi also brought the supply chain. And on the top of that, they also hiring the entire team and some of products development, uh, the new features also made to respond to the Indian market. And uh, besides that, they also did a little bit alteration to their existing business model instead of purely relying on online channels, they also need to penetrate to the uh, local market 
So they actually work heavily with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealers and the distributors uh, in to penetrate to the rural area as well. So I think that is, uh, you know, make Xiaomi a little bit similar to the other brand like Oppo and Vivo. Um, so I think in, you know, from 2015 to 2019, perhaps before pandemic is really the golden time for, uh, for Xiaomi, because at that moment, uh, India also has this, uh, you know, Made in India initiative. So in that sense, the local government also put a lot of incentives to attract, uh, you know, uh, international investors and the big firms. So uh, I think, you know, when we consider those, you know, conditions together, that actually makes uh, Xiaomi very successful in India. And also in that category, they really, uh, except for some, you know, Chinese, uh, like Oppo, Vivo, uh, owner has retreated, right? So uh, except for those brands, they barely have, uh, you know, strong competition from the local brands uh, either. So in that sense, I think Xiaomi in India has been really successful. Another interesting observation we observe is, you know, when we talk about the fan-based business model, it requires a lot of, uh, you know, emotional bond um, between the firm and the consumers. Now, uh, that bear a lot of, uh, you know, culture uh, implications. So at that moment, we were asking the question, can that business model travel across culture gap and uh, to our surprise, it's kind of very successful when you, uh, you know, integrate with the local uh, localization localization strategy. I happened to attend the, you know, the uh, opening of flagship store in the UAE. I was very surprised to to see the enthusiasm of me fans, you know, those fans of Xiaomi brand. So that's pretty much also convinced me that oh, um, actually sometimes we think like liability of foreigners may not be may not be you know uh, easily taken for granted there is always way to cross the gap yeah so, so so I think you make a very interesting point about the fan base that uh, that Xiaomi has created and that's clearly been its uh, strategy but at the same time for example uh, there are these geopolitical headwinds for example in India and and more broadly around the world. Uh, that not just Xiaomi but Chinese companies are facing, and so so on the one hand you you can say that uh, well we have a fan base, but on the other hand there are these uh, government uh, actions that are happening. Uh, how do you see how do you see this playing out in the sense of uh, you know will will it uh, significantly affect uh, Xiaomi's position in India? Is it likely that uh, it'll um, you know retreat? Uh, uh, and focus more on uh, uh, deepening the uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, market share because, you know, uh, this is, again, I guess, a question that Rafael asked uh, that I brought up earlier, but also this headwind question is from uh, uh, Praveen Paranjothi, who asks that, you know, Indian government has moved, and so what are the implications of that? Uh, I think based on Xiaomi case, although at that moment when we conduct the case, we were also very optimistic. Um, but now when we look back, uh, we realize that we also underestimate the impact of regulatory risk and uh, external environment on uh, you know, internationalization strategy. And at that moment, I think Xiaomi also did a lot of uh, you know, um, uh, activities for instance, they strengthened the uh, relationship with the government. And obviously at that moment, the government was also very open for uh, international forms uh, to invest and bring the, you know, uh, to boost the local manufacturing capacity. On the top of that, Xiaomi also attract Tata's investment. So Tata as, uh, you know, probably the most well-known uh, conglomerate uh, firms in India with their investment is a kind of strong signal for legitimacy and acceptance. And also with the whole 100% Indian team on social media and managing the operation from R&D to manufacturing and retail. So all of these actually, you know, make Xiaomi uh, really, uh, you know, benefit and also reap the benefit and that they should, they should be successful. I don't see any reason for them not to be successful. Okay. But, okay. When we, <laughs> but when we look back, 
Uh, now, you know, what happened recently, you realized actually the regulatory risk could be so big, you know? So the local government could actually change the policy overnight and then put all the investment uh, at the risk. So I think that is probably the wake up call for not only Chinese firms, because it's also applicable to many American firms as well. So it's, 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 it, we, we should never underestimate the regulatory risk. So it's not like a pure form of decision or action that could determine the result of uh, international uh, expansion. And uh, so that is, uh, you know, when I look back to look at our own study, uh, this is what I learned. <laughs> So it's really important to yep. understand the government behavior in international expansion. Now, yeah. re regarding another issue, uh, I think some audience asked about the diversification, how one form can manage a such wide range of portfolio. Uh, I would encourage you to check out uh, the Xiaomi website. They have ecosystem. And actually, they build the academy to incubate over 200 brands. Now, what they did is once they acquired the top level supply chain cap capabilities, that when they develop the industry design capabilities, when they build the storefront, they also have the, it's a retail company, by the way, they also have the largest storefront um, online channel. They open all of these to their ecosystem partners. So Xiaomi actually transformed itself to become incubator. Uh, so they use the metaphor like a bamboo. You know, Chinese bamboo can grow very fast, but they share the same soil. So this is how they actually can manage this wide range of portfolio of products to provide the complete IoT ecosystem and products. Um, and this also increased the usage of uh, Xiaomi uh, uh, smartphone. And this has become another levy for them to work with the local telecom uh, you know, partners. At least uh, this is the only reason, uh, most important reason for them to work with say like local telecom uh, you know, firm in UAE, simply because users spend more time on Xiaomi device than the other smartphones. So you see they actually managed to close the loop, yeah. There's a related uh, question from Basar Polat, which maybe I'll, see if Wally you want to take it. One is that, that is that, you know, yes, they've managed to do all these things that you were spelling out just now, Kathy, but how do you, how do you ensure uh, that you're at the technical cutting edge and uh, at the quality cutting edge, if you've got such a vast portfolio and you're managing this, you know, over 100 partners, I mean, it's, it's quite, quite something. So how, how does that, uh, how does that happen? <laughs> it's true. It's it's hard to manage the like the big portfolio of the products, right? I mean, that is the general management issues for for any company when they become bigger and also diversify in many many places. So if we think about the development patterns or models, right? So broadly, like in the past, I think there's there are two generic way. One is like pure ecosystem, right? Like, you know, Apple have like the Apple store, they provide certain support, uh, you know, get, um, you know, the app developers to develop apps and put in the Apple store. Apple store doesn't really get into like intervention of like, how, uh, they set the rules, but they didn't get the deep involvement, right? So this is one way it's kind of a loosely connected ecosystem. The other way, it's maybe a little bit like the corporate VC, corporate venture capital model, right? So, you know, Intel have the, the CVC arm and then they choose the investments and then for some strategic reason or sometimes for the, for, for, for the financial return. I think Xiaomi, it's kind of unique. It's try to combine these like ecosystem plus the CVC model. So if you take a look of the portfolio, products that they invested, actually they take about like 20 to 30% of the equity shares. And then they, they, they do not just like simply outsource or, you know, acquire a brand. Actually, they get their people, Xiaomi is the engineering team to deeply engage or involve the development of the IoT devices, could be, you know, TV or Alcom or 
router, right? So it's a deep involvement, right? And you can see that most of the IoT uh, products that Xiaomi into it, it's not the big player, which means like to some extent, Xiaomi have the stronger bargaining power. Xiaomi can strongly influence the product design and the quality control. So to me, I think that it's not easy to do it for sure, but they kind of combine the ecosystem plus the CVC. They have the share control plus the engineering teams involvements. And then that one, I think collectively make sure the quality consistency so that from the user's perspective, it's, you know, good quality and reasonable price, right? And this is like how, like what Amitava said, this is like both differentiation and the low cost, which is very attractive, appealing to the user. So Guoli, uh, so, uh, there's a question here, which kind of springs from the things you're saying, which is from Arisha Slam. He says, uh, what are your thoughts about the potential exploitation of the partners? Because clearly uh, uh, Xiaomi is playing an extremely heavy handed role uh, with its partners. And so uh, how do you avoid that crossing that thin line? I mean, it's true. I mean, especially when Xiaomi first started this kind of business model, there's this concern from the partners, okay, you know, small one play with the big one, you know, the chance for the small potato are going to be exported, right? So over time, it needs like first the trust building. The second is like Xiaomi would like to use their ecosystem to try to help the small players to grow. And eventually the the, the the bigger shares still belongs to the uh, you know the ecosystem players so I think it needs some time to build the trust and you can that your partner to see that okay with the Xiaomi systems that I can benefit mm -hmm. so in fact you know that's your 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 spot on because when we were writing the case uh, I did interviews with some of Xiaomi's partners and they were all extremely positive about their relationship with, uh, with Xiaomi. Now, of course, we got contact with these partners through, uh, through Xiaomi. So, you know, there's some bias in the system, obviously, but um, I think that, you know, that's at least uh, not a, a major issue. I can see lots of interesting questions, but uh, we're, uh, we've essentially run out of time. So, uh, let me thank uh, you, Kathy, for uh, joining in. And Guoli, I know it's very late for you because you're sitting there in Singapore. Um, so thank you very much to both of you for uh, making the time to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, a big thank you to Pascal and Sandra for uh, you know, organizing this whole thing. And, uh, uh, and of course, to all of you participants for uh, joining in and asking questions. And I'm really sorry that, you know, we weren't able to take all the questions. So thank you very much. And, uh, you know, happy to try to take the questions offline. If you can email me uh, uh, the questions. Take care. Bye-bye.